Recording in progress. Hey folks, we are going to call our panel up to the table. sure that we've got all the right people here. I see three panelists and I've got four written down here. No? We're good. Ooh, who are we missing? I guess we'll find out when we do introductions. It could be anyone's guess. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we've closed the doors, but we still may have some people coming in. So, um, Welcome to our afternoon panel. Excited to see you here. Um, so we are uh, talking about emergency management and the SDGs. So hopefully you are all in the right room. Wonderful. Okay. Here is the context of this panel. Indigenous communities across the world have developed intricate and time-tested methods of managing emergencies and crisis in their environments. These methods often encompass a holistic approach grounded in connection between people and the land. This panel seeks to explore the intersection of emergency development and are intrinsically linked and mutually reinforcing. So this promises to be an exciting conversation. Um, I would like to uh, welcome our esteemed guests to our panel. And um, as always, I, I really hold the Q&A at the end of these presentations as quite sacred. So we are going to do everything we can to make sure that you folks also get a chance to join the conversation, whether it be comments or questions. So as you hear people speak, if things come to your mind, please note them down. 
Um, we did have some folks approaching the microphone during presentations yesterday. There were just some people who just couldn't write it down and they had something to say. And I think that's okay too. Yeah. Um, for the panelists, um, sometimes I can be a bit strict on time, but I like to allow people to speak. But if we do get short on time, I'll let you know. All right, um, I'm going to allow you guys to introduce yourselves. So if we can start off with a quick introduction from each of you, uh, we would appreciate that. Full face, full beauty. <laughs> Uh, kia ora koutou. I introduce myself and acknowledge the land and the ancestors and the people yesterday, so just quickly reiterating that. Kia ora koutou, koutou ngā mana whenua, the people of the land, uh, greetings to you all. Um, uh, Simon Lambert uh, from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, my tribes are Tūhoi and Ngāti Ruapani, my Waikaremoana, a place called Waikaremoana, Central North Island, live in Christchurch, which uh, had big earthquakes 2011, which is how I got interested in disaster research. Um, uh, was at the still am a, uh, adjunct prof in Indigenous Studies at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, also, did you? Yeah, so I do, I am Chief Science Advisor Māori for the Ministry for the Environment. Not wearing that hat today, didn't wear it yesterday. I would be constrained if I was representing uh, the good people in Crown of Aotearoa, New Zealand. But here I also am Chief Scientist for a group called Te Tira Whakamātaki, which is a Māori environmental not for profit primarily active in biosecurity, which we interpret and manage as, as emergency management slash disastrous reduction. Uh, masters on environmental vulnerability in the Pacific, Pacific Islands, uh, and then PhD in small-scale Māori horticulture, so I got into environmental management. 2011, earthquakes, suddenly I became an expert in disaster research because you've got to follow the money, you've got to see which way the wind is blowing. Um, and uh, ended up doing some, some sessions in the UNDRR space in Geneva, uh, Montreal, Cancun, so global and regional platforms. And by then I was, no, when did I come to Canada? Saskatchewan 2017. Um, uh, started to, I met some firefighters, some people doing cultural burnings and stuff here, Amy Christensen, who is, is well known in that space and others. Uh, and really, um, Luckily, like you've got to write stuff down, but got some funding from TD Bank to look at indigenous evacuations uh, during COVID. So how, how did communities respond and react to the evacuation drama slash trauma, logistical challenges during a, a, a pandemic? Uh, that's still going on. Postdoc there called Dr. Lilia Yumagalova. I don't know if anyone's heard of her. She is a rock star. She makes me look like I know what I'm doing. Uh, and we have a project, and I've talked briefly about it with some of you, uh, supporting parents uh, with children in evacuations um, using narrative therapy and play therapy. So working along, we're developing a, t a toolkit for parents, if you like, so how they can better support and understand their kids when they're in an in a, a emergency shelter and evacuation situation. Kia ora. Tanse, Pisemo Che, Netsiga San. Uh, Nia Apirigosa Neyao Oche Pakjoanis uh, Nia Escotewino uh, Egua Oscapios Oche Ivan Ladishers Mikaseo um, Ni Pakoi Simuin Mama Wini Toin. Uh, my name is Ramsey. I'm a Metis youth from uh, Alberta. I'm a member of the Metis Nation of Alberta. And uh, I'm currently the Director of Emergency Management for Fishing Lake Métis Settlement. Uh, the last five wildfire seasons, I've worked on Helitac crews in Alberta and uh, have worked, uh, have been on the front lines of a lot of evacuations of uh, indigenous communities and uh, front lines of a lot of communities that have been uh, hit by wildfires. Um, and I'm also a student at Nate uh, for Disaster and Emergency Management. And um, I think, yeah, I think that's pretty much everything about me that's relevant to this, so <laughs> uh, it's nice to meet everyone here, and thank you for uh, having me here. Tansi, my name is Dane D'Souza. Uh, I'm a citizen of the Métis Nation of Alberta. Uh, my family names are Sutherland and Sinclair from the Selkirk area of the Red River Valley. I currently work as the Climate Change and Emergency Management Policy Advisor for the Métis National Council. Uh, prior to this, I worked six years as a wildland firefighter in Alberta as well. 
Uh, fire's been my passion pretty much since the very first one I've been on, and I was fortunate enough to do a master's at UBC in uh, 2019, 2018, 2019. I'll remember that one. I graduated the day COVID started. Um, and uh, a lot of what I was studying my master's was uh, the fire management techniques of our ancestors and how we used fire in a good way to manage the land and steward our relationship with the land. And uh, I felt that Ramsey's introduction was a bit short here. Um, when I met Ramsey two, three years ago, I was putting on a wildfire workshop in, in Edmonton and I got an email at two in the morning saying, hey, I heard you're putting on a workshop, can I come tomorrow? And my initial reaction was not a pleasant one, but uh, <laughs> I managed to think, what would Aaron Myers do? And I, I messaged Ramsey back, yeah, sure, be there tomorrow, but don't expect any food. <laughs> and uh, Ram was at the door at 6 a.m. before he even got there. And uh, within five minutes of talking to him, I was like, oh, this is somebody we need in the room. He can have a plate. So uh, thanks for being here, Ram. And uh, <laughs> Simon, thanks for making it all this way. I'm really excited for this panel day. And also, I'd like to extend my thanks to uh, Kate Gillis, Andrea Koshi, and everybody at the Métis National Council who made this event possible. So thank you, and uh, really looking forward to, the, to having a yarn with you all today. Wow, we've got some stars in the room today. This is exciting. Um, my goodness, you've even thrown me off my question. I just want to just get you guys talking. Um, but we do have good questions, so we're going to ask those. So this is for anyone who feels compelled to answer. So please feel free. Uh, to grab the mic um, if, if you'd like to. So the first question is, um, how do Indigenous approaches to emergency management align or differ from mainstream emergency management strategies? So once more, how do Indigenous approaches to emergency management align or differ from mainstream emergency management strategies? Whoever's feeling compelled, please go, yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Awesome. Um, so going first, I can use the word we, we, holistic. All right. If I was to sum it up in one word, it'd be holistic. Um, but there's a lot more to it than that. And first of all, give a shout out to, to if we look at the Indigenous uh, first responders, professional and, and semi-professional and, and, and unprofessional, as in not fully trained or supported, uh, indigenous Coast Guards on the BC coast saving lives. Um, think to um, Beardy's Okamasis First Nation just north of Saskatoon, 2015, Res Cross, um, putting people up in the hockey stadium and feeding them traditional foods because you want your comfort food when you're, you're out of your space, out of your comfort. Uh, First Australians, um, uh, Aborigines in Australia, First Australians we call them now, um, supporting communities in cyclones, which are happening more and more frequently and all that. And in, in New Zealand, we have marae, our community spaces, which act as, as semi-official civil defence centres. So we do all that, and we do it, um, it's impromptu, all right, because it comes from a cultural framing of how to respond to people in need. And it always cracks me up when, when people, non-Indigenous people, are hosted in, in those sort of situations. They go, wow, everyone's so friendly. Everyone's so welcoming, you're like, like like, what were you expecting? People do not expect us to be human and, and for elders to crack jokes and for people to just accommodate your need for conversation or physical contact, touch, you know, cuddling, we're very physical, boisterous people where I come from. They're always surprised that we're kind of human and it always cracks me up. Um, but we're not resourced to do that properly. So we have a holistic approach that we kind of do cheap or for free. And I've seen a lot of people make a lot of money out of disasters. You may be familiar with the book Disaster Capitalism, Naomi Klein. Uh, you can buy disaster bonds, all right? These are non-Indigenous innovations to, in some way, manage disasters. So I think we have a more realistic approach. It's holistic. There's a lot of love and respect in there. It's not... Uh, you know, when we, we're not as clinical, say, and I have a lot of respect for Red Cross and other organisations, but there's a, you know, they're organisations, they're huge, kind of sometimes a little clinical and abrupt in how they deal with Indigenous people. It's kind of like a diplomatic way of saying that racism has been identified in the response from, from certain uh, organisations like that. And I know Red Cross has addressed some of that and all that, but it has to be put out there. Um, and so... Uh, 
before I pass over to these ridiculously good-looking young guys, um, <laughs> there's a, there's a, yeah, I think I'll, uh, there, you guys look, <laughs> but, um, but there's this paradox, right, because we have the resilience, because we talk about that all the time, but, but, you know, I've got to say, settler colonialists are about the most resilient people I've ever seen. They just keep on keeping on. Capitalism is the most resilient human design system I've ever seen. It's easier to imagine uh, uh, the end of the planet than the end of capitalism. People aren't talking about the end of capitalism more than people are talking about the end of the planet. And that, to me, is so bizarre. And, and the conversations in our communities and emergencies and disasters... Are, are grounded in some pretty unfortunate experiences. So we are responding and recovering to colonization. Everything else is kind of, like it ain't as hard as that, all right? And I've said to non-Indigenous, and most, mostly I speak to non-Indigenous audiences, or often speak to non-Indigenous audiences, like you want to know what the future's going to look like, look at the experiences of Indigenous people. You will be dispossessed, you will be shunted off your land because your land's flooded or burnt or whatever, and you're going to lose a lot of what you thought, well, what you took for granted. I, that's how I see the future playing out for non-Indigenous people. I kind of have a little bit of, I don't, a little bit of fear and concern for them because they're not really that well prepared for that. Uh, yeah, it's hard to follow up on that. That was really good. <laughs> you uh, you uh, touched on a lot there. Um, but uh, the main thing that comes to mind for me is, uh, for differences, is just the priorities are very different. And uh, what we measure uh, as uh, important. Um, for most emergency management agencies, they have a major focus on like the economy and human-built uh, factors in what's at risk. Uh, whereas for us, uh, I feel like indigenous people just have far more consideration for the land, for the environment. Uh, for example, um, Alberta wildfires uh, priorities, provincial priorities, are human life, communities, watersheds and soils, um, natural resources and infrastructure. Nowhere does it mention there about anything about the land, anything about the environment. And the only thing that mentions anything about the land, well, I guess watersheds and soils, but that's a very specific one nobody really talks about much, but natural resources specifically. That's framing it in a way specifically related to the economy, related to industry. And that's kind of the main consideration that they have when they're making their uh, decisions on priorities and how they're going to approach natural uh, natural disasters is what kind of impact is this going to have on our economy? What kind of impact is this going to have on our industry? And is the industry uh, going to be mad at us if we uh, don't do something? Um, and in my work, like that's something I've seen so much is decisions being made based off of impact solely to industry. And that's, that's the language that's... Uh, used a lot of the time when instead I'm seeing, uh, from my eyes, I'm seeing the impacts on the environment, I'm seeing uh, the impacts on people's trap lines, I'm seeing impacts on vulnerable communities. And vulnerable, uh, vulnerable communities, indigenous communities, they don't have, uh, frankly, much uh, um, industrial or economic value compared to timber or oil leases or pipelines. And uh, that contributes to a lot of the decisions that are made by people in emergency management and the people managing these natural disasters. And even uh, the phrase natural disaster is a little off because it's only a disaster when we put ourselves in the way of these natural events. Like these are natural occurring things that are supposed to happen. They're natural cycles. We're not the ones that built entire communities and houses on floodplains. Um, <laughs> uh, and we, instead of like realizing, oh, we did this, that was a huge mistake, we better like not develop in this floodplain anymore. Instead, we're like, we better find a way to prevent flooding or like mitigate the impacts of flooding in this region. And it's like, you're, you're, the indigenous perspective is you need to respect nature. You need to respect your, place in this ecosystem we live in. We are, we are equal to these, these events. We are equal to the wildfires. We're equal 
to whether we are equal to the animals, the water, the air, everything. Uh, and we need to recognize our place and where we stand in all this. And we need to s stop having this obsession of dominating things, controlling things, controlling these hazards. And instead, if we just realize uh, <laughs> our vulnerabilities, uh, instead of trying to control everything, then uh, uh, that would have a much more effective uh, result in preventing risk and loss from these disasters. Um, so yeah, that's uh, probably the biggest difference, I would say. But in general, for alignments, uh, uh, there's a lot of good to come from the work that's done in emergency management, like the pillars, prevention, mitigation, preparedness, uh, response and recovery, like those are very general, very applicable things to everything. And uh, um, it's there's a lot to be learned from the emergency management field that can be applied to the indigenous field. It, the difference is just how it's applied. The application is what needs to be shifted to an indigenous perspective on the land and these events. Thank you. Right arm. Um, Start on a positive note, and then we'll take it from there and see what we end up with. Uh, I'll start with some alignments that I see. Um, so just to, to reiterate the question, it's how do indigenous approaches to emergency management align or differ from mainstream emergency management strategies? Um, and where, where I see alignment is in the realm of emergency management, emergencies, disasters, whether it's infectious disease, wildfires, floods, uh, cyber attacks, uh, they don't gerrymander, they don't discern between our boundaries, they don't stop at the Saskatchewan border, wait for the pop proper public approvals and then continue on to Alberta. Um, they don't stop and ask, oh, are you Métis or First Nations? And oh, what's, what, what reservation are you on? Oh, okay, you have to fill out this paperwork, <laughs> I'll burn down your house and then we can proceed from there. Um, that's not how these things work, but that's how we organize ourselves around them. So we're aligned in how we suffer these impacts, how we suffer some of that hubris that Ramsey just kind of alluded to. And uh, we're gonna be beating up a lot on Alberta wildfire today. Uh, so I make no apologies for that, but if you're in the room and you're part of public safety, ISC or CERNAC, you're equally as culpable to this. It's just, this is our area of expertise. Um, but at, at political levels is where we really do differ. In indigenous communities, in Métis communities, in Métis political structures, in Métis policy structures, how we mobilize, how our communities are built is rooted in our culture, and that's a culture of helping our neighbor. That's also a place that we do align with non-indigenous communities when it comes to emergencies, is how we respond. The reality is when you're at the on-the-ground level, and I'm sure we've all seen this on this panel, is. When you're on the ground level, it's about helping your neighbor. Wildfire is my area of expertise. I've seen wildfires where, it, I was in Fort McMurray when it burnt down. Fort McMurray didn't matter if you were a Sudanese refugee who'd be in Canada for two years, settlers whose family had been on farmland for generations, Métis folks who'd been in that area for as long as your family can remember, First Nations, it didn't matter. It was all hands on deck and it's everybody mobilizing to protect their neighbor, protect their community, protect those bonds between each other. And I think that's somewhere we really do align on the ground level. But as we kind of zoom out, that falls apart. And we don't, or I say we, Canada does not support that cohesion and those bonds in emergency management that are intrinsic to a Métis way of life, an indigenous way of life that we've learned from our ancestors as Métis people and how we've structured our societies and our communities. Um, I'll give you an example of this. Last night I got a message from a colleague of mine saying, hey, Alberta just extended the wildfire season. Have you seen this? Okay, well, does this mean they're giving permissions to wildfires now? It's, it's February 22nd. Wildfire season traditionally starts March 1st. What do we gain? What was the purpose of that? Does this mean that now we can all be scared about wildfires a bit earlier? There's no preparedness. They asked for 100 wild firefighters two days ago, funding for 100 wild firefighters that won't show up till May 21st and will show up with absolutely no experience. And then they say, that we're gonna have these guys fighting fires at night. 
And we're going to get some volunteers in here, too. That's a political move. That has absolutely nothing to do with protecting lives, homes, communities, livelihoods, the economy, any of those values that Ramsey just mentioned, it has nothing to do with protecting any of them. It's about shifting blame. It's about not being prepared. There is no preparedness in Alberta right now. And that's not our way as Indigenous peoples, as Métis people. We don't wait until fire season to start preparing the land, to start preparing our communities, to start putting good fire on the land. We wait for the land to tell us. We wait until those conditions are right. We wait until we see what the earth, what the land, what the waters, what the skies have to offer for us to live in a good way. And when I say live in a good way, I mean to live in a safe, good way. And that's something we've been doing since time immemorial. That's something we've done long before Alberta wildfire was a thing, long before public safety was a thing, long before ISK or CERNAC were a thing. And we've done it with great success, as Ramsey just mentioned. I don't, I, don't, I don't know of too many Métis communities that were built in a floodplain unless somebody told them they had to build there. And when I think of my experiences as a Métis person, somebody who has the, the, the honor and the privilege to enter these spaces and have political ears for these conversations, and then also my experience as somebody who's boots on the ground, uh, I think of the first time in my life I ever truly felt Métis. And that was on the Chuck Egg Fire in 2019. And it was up in Paddle Prairie area, and I was up there with Paul Couture and Lauren LaRondell. And I, a couple years later, had gotten to a bit of a yarn with Lauren and Paul, and they said, Dan, we didn't know you were Métis. I got a last name like the Sousa. I said, oh, yeah, I'm Métis, and you know, I didn't grow up Métis. I don't know, I didn't have much connection to the community. And Lauren said to me, Dan, where were you last year? Oh, I was on oh, wildfire, you know. I don't know, where were we hanging out? I was like, we were in Paddle Prairie. He said, okay, Dan, so you stood shoulder to shoulder with Métis wildland firefighters protecting Métis communities. I really don't think I can think of anything that's more Métis. And that's something I've always carried with me in these spaces. Is that how we connect, how we live in a good way, how we support each other, that's something that to me is intrinsically Métis. And that's something that I don't think we're seeing alignment on right now. And it's causing deaths. It's causing the loss of houses and livelihoods and communities and bonds. I think that's something that can really be learned from not only by Canada, but the international community as well. We're using the example of wildfires a lot, but wildfires are just one thing. During floods, you're gonna call your neighbor to help fill up sandbags, pick up your kids from school if an emergency comes up and you gotta go somewhere else. Emergencies aren't just things that make headlines, they're the little things every single day that we respond to in kinship. I'm the facilitator, right. Um, that is incredibly powerful. Um, drew me right in. Um, thank you for those answers. Uh, the second question builds on all of those principles. How can incorporating Indigenous methods of land stewardship into mainstream emergency management frameworks enhance resilience and sustainability in communities worldwide? And I'll just repeat it. It's kind of a, it's a big one. How can incorporating indigenous methods of land stewardship into mainstream emergency management frameworks enhance resilience and sustainability in communities worldwide? It's up to you guys. Yeah, whatever way makes sense. Um, first, first, I'd give a nod to the SDGs in the UN and... and um, uh, there's a lovely saying from a New Zealand Prime Minister uh, about the UN that it's a comedy trying to prevent a tragedy. And if you look at, at the um, uh, Security Council machinations, uh, it's like, these clowns, all right. But, I mean, there is a, there's, a, there's a terrible logic to their, their actions and their, their thinking. Um, uh, real politic, you know, that's, that's writ large, and it's people's lives, again, that are in impacted. So the SDGs... Uh, um, are an acknowledgement that, that we're in trouble as a, a global society and something needs to be done, and they've categorised it as they do. Um, addressing that, absolutely, I'd argue, indigenous approaches for, for land and development and the environment and people are, are necessary 
but I'd also have to argue they're insufficient, and they're insufficient because they're not going to be at a scale at this stage. They're not going to be operationalised at a scale that's going to significantly shift uh, some pretty scary parameters that we're approaching, right? So we've blown through one and a half degrees, we'll, we'll blow through two, we'll blow, probably blow through two and a half degrees global heating. It's not distributed equally. The north that was mentioned earlier in the panel uh, is going to have much more uh, terrible effects from this global heating. So um, nature-based solutions were mentioned by the Sami speaker, uh, and that's, and I've seen those named in, in New Zealand as um, it's very appealing to a neoliberal state, nature-based solutions, like it's kind of packaged up in a way that supports, as I go back to my comment on the resilience of capitalism, we have private capital flooding into, into um, nature-based solutions and all that. And why would they do that? Like capital has a logic that they see profit in this in some way. It is supporting them in some way. A lot of nature-based solutions you'll see supported by philanthropists and industry are located near where these people live and near where they own holiday homes. There's a lot of people look at New Zealand to invest this stuff, right? And there's a logic to that as well. Shania Twain bought property there. You know that? The husband got it in the divorce. But, um, <laughs> so, uh, but it's seen as a bolt hole. So again, nature-based solutions, some people are looking at New Zealand or the moon or Mars to, and they use the word colonise. Right? It's, not, it's not by accident. So what was Jeff Bezos wearing? I'm going on a rant now. What was Jeff Bezos wearing when he got off his rocket? A cowboy hat, right? It's really, it's really explicit, the thinking, all right? So the reason I'm saying that is a um, very interesting story, uh, and I bumped into a, an elder from Kiribati, New York Street. I recognised a tie he had, and I said hello, and we spoke. And I remember a, a story from, I Googled it before, about 2014, 2015. Kiribati, 32 atolls, one or two or three metres above sea level, highly uh, vulnerable to sea level rise, obviously, purchased 5,500 acres in Fiji. So I asked this guy about that, and he goes, oh, yes, it's $9 million US. And he goes, we may own the land, and he held up, like, the contract, but the land is not ours, all right? So if and when the locals in Fiji want to take their land back, the Kiribati people know that that is their right. The bits of paper is it's nothing, right? So what we'll see, uh, and again, thinking of land stewardship, the more success. So let's let's put some let's put some let's throw this out there. The more successful we are at that, the safer that land looks. The better that land looks, the more it's worth, and they'd put an economic value on it. You know, the, the system does that. Um, as we look at this concept of managed retreat, you might see where I'm going with this. Ultimately, we are going to have hundreds of millions of people forced to move to other places to live and survive, and they'll, they might be embarrassed about taking indigenous land again, but you know what? They'd do it for their own survival because that's what people do. So um, the risk, like, do we need it? Yes, absolutely. What, in what way do we get safer? Like, because I'm not convinced, like we're not safe, so I'm not convinced that full expression of our, our knowledges and approaches will necessarily make us safer if what we are creating is something that other people covet. And why wouldn't they covet it? Like, beautiful, it's gonna be beautiful and safe. And wherever they're from is screwed. And the last thing I'd say is that we're actually an increasingly urban people. Māori are 85% urban. Uh, I don't know what the percentage is for, for Métis or First Nations, but I, I can guarantee it's going up for lots of simple reasons. So my father left uh, our lands uh, for education, for um, uh, income, uh, and, <laughs> and to meet girls he wasn't related to. Right? 
You know what I mean? Uh, and so uh, we, we're urban, and yet we're, so we're frag- that knowledge is fragmenting. And the knowledge we need, like cyber attacks, like my parents are terrible with technology. They get scammed and defrauded all the time. So we're extremely vulnerable to things that are not necessarily just urban, but the pollution, the, the noise pollution, the toxic environment, the air, the highly processed food, the stuff that congregates in and around urban areas uh, is, is also a risk factor. And yet it's just not, you know, it's, you can only worry about dying from so many ways in any given day. You know, I don't worry about my food so much, right? So I think, I think it's a really interesting time for us to have a philosophical debate about the role of, of our knowledge and our lands and waters in the survival of our communities. Uh, and you know that movie, um, Blood Quantum, the vampire, the indigenous, uh, not vampire, a zombie movie. If you haven't seen it, my God, it's, it's hilarious. But it's got lots of dead people eating babies and stuff. Like, it's really scary. But, uh, but it's a really a nice flip on, on who's at risk and what the risk and dangers are and all that and, and how, to, how to start thinking about a future where, where the neighbour, the bonds and all that are in the urban space are really hard to maintain. You know, I've lived in a tower block. I don't know people next door to me. All right, it's a really alienating environment, and that's where we're ending up. Right, so I think we've got this, the concept of land stewardship, stepping back and looking at it philosophically, how can that be applied to urban spaces? How can that be applied to, to other countries? Because you might end up living in another country. Right? Come down to Shania's uh, ex-husband. <laughs> I don't even know his name, I don't even know, wouldn't recognise him. And on that, the funny thing of that, everyone who gets a bolt hole in New Zealand, the guy PayPal who invented PayPal, he's, he's got one. Um, they think they're so friendly and nice like hobbits and that they'll be perfectly safe when, when the rest of the world ends and that will let them live in their frickin' bunker up in the beautiful high country and they'll be perfectly safe. So, yeah, I was just looking at the question again and it's uh, interesting, like incorporating indigenous methods of land stewardship. But I think that indigenous methods of land stewardship is the solution. It's not about incorporating it, including it. It is the, it is the solution, and indigenous people are the leaders of these solutions. Like, we need to lead Canada in this climate crisis um, because we do have the tools and the knowledge in order to provide solutions for everyone in Canada. Um, what they have been doing so far, it hasn't worked. Just uh, in, in general, I think everyone can agree on that. All the goals they've set, um, they're not gonna reach them. Uh, I think that's a pretty blatant truth. And um, that has to do a lot with uh, a lot of uh, restraints around like capitalism, like you were saying. Uh, a lot of restraints around budgets and funding and um, just how is it gonna impact the economy. And that's a lot of, that's what I've been hearing a lot of is how like all these industrial solutions to climate change, pretty much like greenwashing uh, like finding solutions to cr- uh, climate change, it's uh, it's it's because they're uh, all the industries they don't want to be left behind in this. They're trying to find a way to benefit. They're trying to find a way to make the most money off of finding the solutions to this. But that's not the kind of uh, attitude that can lead this very important initiative like that cannot be the guiding philosophy is like okay like yes this is the right thing to do but how can we make the most money doing it it's about doing the right thing and i think that's an important part of indigenous perspectives and doing the right thing doesn't take funding into consideration doing the right thing doesn't take budgets into consideration it doesn't take the economy into consideration uh, when we go harvesting, we don't put tobacco down half the time because we're on a tobacco budget. We put down tobacco <laughs> because we we put down tobacco every time because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> you don't say like, oh, like oh, it's getting really expensive. Like, <laughs> like I don't know if I can afford this anymore. Um, <laughs> and 
that's, that's the kind of attitude they have about this, is like how much can we afford to do about climate change? We, we need to look at what needs to be done, recognize it's the right thing, and just form our systems around getting that done, not <laughs> trying to accommodate the solutions around the systems we already have. So that's the biggest, uh, a really uh, big shift that needs to come from incorporating indigenous perspectives. And uh, yeah, it is the solution, like specifically for wildfire again, ta always talking about wildfire. Um, our like traditional practices with cultural burning, like that is the solution to wildfire. And a, coin that was, uh, a term that was coined during the Métis wildfire workshop that Dane uh, organized like two or so years ago, there was a term coined there, uh, the wildfire industrial complex. And uh, that is, like I'm sure some of you have heard like the military industrial complex. That is such a good way to describe uh, the system they use right now. It's, there's uh, just such an economy built around fighting fire uh, and managing wildfire the way we have been for the last 100 years. And uh, they're, they have such a strong grip on keeping that there because they don't, they don't want to let go of that economy that has been built around wildfire. All the helicopter companies that benefit from it, all the air tankers. Um, there's, there, there's so many hands in the pot of like how wildfire is being mismanaged now. And we literally have the solutions. And there's people like me and Dane and so many people in the Thunderbird Collective and Salish Firekeepers and uh, Finesse, uh, First Nations Emergency Services Society, that are just like begging to be like, hey, please listen to us. Like, we have the solutions. Like, please just do it. But no, there's such a stronghold in this wildfire industrial complex. And it has its roots in capitalism. And uh, that's like a. Uh, I don't know, like a really touchy thing to bring up, unfortunately. Um, but uh, it's true, like, indigenous values just have to do with doing the right thing for the people. Um, and, yeah, like, <laughs> it's, it's uh, just scary thinking about how much uh, we, we limit ourselves by having to conform to these systems that have been put in place by, I don't know, people that frankly just didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> like they, they had no idea, right? And uh, another thing I just want to touch on is uh, urbanization. You were talking about urbanization earlier. Uh, that is a huge, uh, th yeah, that's a reality, and it's, uh, it is a risk factor for uh, our indigenous community. Um, our rural communities, they, they really struggle with building resiliency, and it's because uh, it's it's hard to build a life in those communities. It's uh, because we live in this system where you need to have a certain income in order to have a certain certain standard of living, and you need access to these these services that, um, frankly, there's just so many barriers put up um, by industry and the government that it really make, makes life and sustain, like having a sustainable way of life in these places very difficult. Um, one of my elders, he's from a community uh, on the shores of Lake Athabasca called Big Point. And uh, this is an example of like greenwashing climate solutions. The Peace Canyon Dam built all the way in BC impacted the water, water levels. Uh, in the delta they live on that feeds the Lake Athabasca. And it limited, ac it cut off access to so many places that used, they used to harvest. And they, they, it's made living there so much more difficult. And so a Métis community of, it used to be hundreds of people, now there's maybe 10 people that just have cabins there and go there once in a while. And it's, it's examples of like that greenwashing of climate solutions that uh, really impact indigenous communities and make sustaining sustainable ways of life very difficult and really like urban lifestyles like it's it's uh, it's not I'm just gonna say it's not as sustainable as being on the land you know harvesting for everything you have just having a campfire like heating your house with a wood stove like that's more sustainable than urbanization right uh, 
And another thing is just our neighbors. Dane was talking about caring for our neighbors. And that point about global re resiliency is very important. We're only as resilient as our least resilient communities. And so we need to focus on building capacity in our most vulnerable communities, and that'll help make all of Canada more resilient. And I think that's like an important part that Indigenous people need to touch on more uh, in order to sell uh, our solutions to the rest of Canada. Um, yeah, thank you. After hearing all that, all I have left is my notes about uh, traditional night vision helicopter goggles and Punisher skull patches for the cops. So this should be pretty short. <laughs> no, I, 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 I really would like to echo what has been said by my two colleagues here and try not to repeat it, but build upon it. Um, you know, when I, I think of indigenous methods of land stewardship and then emergency management, I think there's also the concept of emergencies and emergency management as Indigenous peoples approach them. And they don't happen in a silo, they don't happen with one department and then get transferred over to the next. They are very much, to use a word that Simon kicked us off with, holistic. And I think when we think about Indigenous science, technology, knowledge, I think about language as well. You know, I, I unfortunately only speak on another language, which isn't Michif, which I'm quite pained to say, but uh, I speak German, and uh, when you speak another language, you have to flick your brain into that other language and think differently and see the world differently. Um, I'm often told I speak German like an eight-year-old Bavarian child, because that's how I learned it through, but when I speak German, that's how I kind of see the world. <laughs> um, but I think of a word that, uh, that, was, that was passed to me, a teaching that was passed to me by, by our, our elders, our, one of my elders, um, and... Ram, we can argue about my pronunciation, maybe even my definition of this after, but please let me have this. And it's uh, the concept of the word Wakotawin. The interconnectedness of everything would be the closest translation I can think of. Please don't make a face. <laughs> and uh, Wakotawin, as it's been taught to me, is the relationship you share with all our relations. And when I say all our relations, I mean the spirit, the soul, the characteristics that are in that blade of grass to the highest tree or from that stone to the highest mountain. It's, as you kind of mentioned, your, your place within those things, your relations to them, how you should steward that relationship. And when I think of Wakotawin, you know, we've kind of expounded quite a bit on natural disasters, natural disasters, a natural phenomenon that we get in the way of. <laughs> and we don't ever stop to think about our place in our Wakotawin and our responsibility to them. I think that's something that's been mentioned here today is that's really missing from emergency management is that, that, that concept of what do we owe? Not what can we take, what can we domineer, what can we steer, what can we mutilate and bastardize and make to our own designs, but rather what can we work with? I think Graham kind of mentioned it, like nature will humble you. I'm, I'm a prairie boy. I, the closest I know I've ever come to death the ocean. I'm doing my best to figure out what goes on with water, but it, it'll rock you, and it, it, it humbles me. Just like the first time I was on a wildfire, that that humbled me. It was seeing that and knowing, like, right, I don't stand a chance. If it's just me in this forest, I don't stand a chance. I need to rely on those around me. I need to trust those around me, and to put my head down and do the work. And I think of another teaching that we were, we were that uh, I was given. And uh, to, you know, that note of water and how water absolutely rocked me and how I'm a bit terrified of the ocean is, I think, the connection that I was taught about our women in water and how, in the Métis worldview, water has the power to change the world slowly and drastically and forever or rapidly and quickly, just like our women do. Women give life just as water does. And I think that's something that's wonderful about Métis communities and the Métis worldview and what can be brought to emergency management. Is last week I was in Banff with folks from all over the Métis nation who hold files or work that's adjacent to emergency management as we try to build this capacity. And the amount of women in that room was remarkable. That's something I found time and time and time again working for the Métis nation is it's always our women at the forefront. 
And that same week, I went and talked to Jane Park, who is a wonderful wildland fire expert and probably leading the most progressive crew in the world for Parks Canada. And she said to me, Dane, how many incident commanders do you know that have their he headline, their name in the headlines in the news when a fire goes wrong? I said, oh, no. She said, do you know who was incident commander on Fort McMurray? I was like, no, I was there for two months and I don't know that. She said, right. She had a fire go one hectare over the area she expected, and her news, if you, her, her name, if you Google her right now, the headlines you will see, it's not even throwing her under the bus. It's throwing her under God knows what. And I think that's something that needs to change in emergency management. That's something that needs to change in how we approach emergency management, because we're losing that conversation. It just becomes the good old boys club playing danger zone and a helicopter on their way to go live out some hoorah fantasy instead of thinking about how can we be more holistic about this? How are we approaching evacuations better? How are we preparing our healthcare systems better for this? How are we doing these things better instead of just this kind of, it's ironic wearing this suit and saying this, but this cowboy attitude. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. All right, I only got a minute or two left here. <laughs> But no, I, I think, you know, it's, it, it's not just indigenous knowledge and science and methods. It's, it's that worldview. It's the way that we approach things. It's the way that we build community. It's the way that we build policy. Um, as Métis people, as indigenous people, there's so much to learn from. Because quite right, you know what, you said it. Every single person in Canada who collects a paycheck to do any form of emergency management has failed you as a taxpayer, as a citizen, and as a neighbor. Who here feels safe this fire season? Me neither. So maybe we need to start doing something a bit better. Maybe we need to start analyzing and looking at different ideas. And you know what? I'm not going to be so negative. This is the favorite part of my job. This is the intersection of truth and reconciliation and climate action. Canada, we just like to look at our feet and go, oh, yeah, that was a nice land acknowledgement. I'm an ally. I don't need allies. I need champions. If you want to come in action, truth and reconciliation, have a part in that, this is how we do it. Our knowledge, our language, our science, our methods, our, our worldviews, they hold means in which we can all live here sustainably. I think that's cool as hell. We were having a conversation earlier about the haka and how everybody knows what the haka is. And to me, that's truth and reconciliation. That's an entire country coming around and being proud about the history of that country before it was colonized, before it became a dominion of the crown, as is our shared history. Where's our haka? I think in Canada, emergency management, resiliency, climate change, that's our haka. That's something that everybody in Canada can join around, whether you're Métis, First Nations, settler, refugee, it doesn't matter. It's something we can all have a hand in. It's the truth of the land that we can all share in. Because we belong to the land, the land doesn't belong to us. Okay. Thank you, all of you. Um, wow, I'm torn be between wanting to hear more and wanting to hear from you. So um, I do want to open up the floor for comments or questions. Um, there's a microphone right there. I think it's also a small enough room that if you've got a big voice, you could just sort of stand up. Um, but yeah, I would like to, to welcome some uh, comments. Oh, you want them on the mic for the recording? All right, okay. Okay, guys. So, questions, comments? The floor is open. Okay. If we have no, yeah, have you got one? I was going to say we, we can uh, we can revert to the uh, to the panel. I always have a back pocket question, but would love to hear yours. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm Ty. I'm the provincial woman's representative at the Métis Nation of Alberta, and Ramsey is my cousin. We're all very <laughs> proud of him. <laughs> Yay, Ramsey! <laughs> um, Ramsey and my dad look a lot alike, so yeah. Um, Ramsey, you told us about the fifth traditional use of fire. I was wondering if you could tell us what the other four are. Definitely. Um, so there's a really long story that goes with it. And I'm not going to share that today, uh, especially because it's being recorded. But uh, uh, the first 
purpose of fire is to keep us warm. And the trend with all these purposes is that they're about balance and they're about bringing, together, uh, bringing people together. And so the first purpose of fire is to keep us warm. We all huddle around that fire. We all come together. You know, that's why we have our campfire. That's where we talk to each other. That's where we connect. So to keep us warm. Uh, the second purpose of fire is to feed us. Uh, that we cook our food on that fire. We eat together. Eating together is another way of coming together. Uh, the second purpose of fire, or third purpose of fire is cleansing. And so that includes cleansing the land, cleansing ourselves, cleansing the earth. That's with cultural burning. That's when Thunderbird uh, brings down lightning and starts a fire. We're cleansing the land. We're smudging the earth. Uh, we're smudging ourselves, we're cleaning ourselves. Um, and then the fourth purpose of fire is to protect us. Uh, it protects us during ceremony. That's why during every powwow, round dance, ceremony, there's always that sacred fire there. And that fire is bringing that light to protect us from everything. That Yeah, <laughs> not going to get that deep into it. but um, And all those purposes, they bring us together and they connect us. And the story goes that if you dishonor those first four purposes of fire, that's when... That's when fire becomes destructive. And my elders told me that fire is actually a two-spirited being. And those first four purposes are that motherly, that, that, that woman's uh, side of fire. Uh, keeping you warm, feeding you, protecting you, cleansing you. And then that fifth side of fire, that's when it becomes destructive. And that's that masculine side. But it's not just destructive, it's about bringing balance. It's about restoring order. It's about when we veer away from our humble path of what we're supposed to be doing, our, our, the good life, the red road, the sweet grass trail, when we veer off that path, that's when fire becomes destructive. And it needs to set us straight again. It needs to bring that balance back. And that's kind of how I interpret these wildfires. That's how I interpret this wildfire crisis. We, we don't, and, and specifically, the fire I'm talking about, it's, it's wood fire. That's, that's the only fire we knew before colonization, right? And we haven't been doing that. We, haven't, we don't warm ourselves with a campfire anymore. We don't cook on a campfire together anymore. We don't smudge as much as we should, and we don't go to ceremony as much as we should. And all of that, I think, has culminated in this wildfire crisis and that spirit coming and trying to restore that order. And to get more scientific about it, uh, the, more, uh, the less frequency of wildfire you have, the more intensity you have. The less frequency of wildfire you have, the more fuel load you have in the forest, and the more massive, intense wildfires you need to have. So it's literally restoring balance, that destructive side of it. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry, everyone. Uh, my question is, you guys were talking about, we need to, like, let's just act. Let's stop talking about it. Let's start doing it. Um, Often that's a lot more difficult than it sounds. What would you do? Let's say you are the ultimate premier leader of the world. What is your what do you, what is a nitty gritty thing you can start with? Like what's a, a practical thing you can begin with when it comes to reframing how we think about emergency management? Great question. Um, yeah, one thing. Uh, I've recently kind of been turned in, tuned into is um, we talk about capacity in emergency management and oh, this is being recorded. Um, right now, we don't have any financial capacity at the Métis Nation. We receive zero dollars of funding to date for any form of emergency management. We have zero dollars of financial capacity. But uh, last week in Banff, I was able to connect with and gather uh, with emergency management professionals from across the Métis Nation who all put their hand up. Actually, one of them is in this room right now. Good to see you, Bobby. Um, who put their hand up and said, I have skills, knowledge, 
And I want to give that back to my nation. I want to give that back to my community. I want to protect my communities, my, my, my family, my, my home. Um, and what that really made me realize is that, oh my God, we have all the capacity in the world. It's just no one's, no one's letting us run with it. No one's giving us the opportunity to support that financially. And um, I think of emergency management, you know, we've been talking a lot about wildfires and natural disasters today. Every single doctor and nurse and paramedic in this country, emergency manager. Teachers, emergency managers. Uh, counselors, emergency managers. Lawyers, they're a bit after the fact, but uh, I'm trying to think of some other boilerplate professions, but you know, there's a, emergencies occur every day to every person. It's kind of like what I ended my first kind of year in there about, you know, it's those kinship ties that maintain those things, but also we have to look at the capacity that resist, exists within our community. And I think the Métis Nation, that is like the most exciting part of my job is like this potential within the Métis Nation to show the world how to do emergency management right how to do it holistically, how to do it from the ground level, looking at the mistakes that have been made, the knowledge that we've been gifted from our ancestors and those who've come before us, and then having that identity and that culture of walking in two worlds. You know, I, I'm, I'm trying my best to pitch this to the federal government that every win for the Métis Nation is a win for Canada. We can give you the blueprint of if you tear down the old boys club, what does that look like that? If for the insurance industry, if, if, if you give $2 to the Métis Nation to go forward with emergency preparedness, how much money does that save the insurance industry? Who's currently pulling out of uh, northern Canada and not insuring anybody for wildfires anymore silently? You know, it all just goes back to this core component of like our solutions are being ignored. And I refuse to, one, have our solutions ignored, but then have our emergency managers offer their services at a discount or a volunteer rate to the people who get it wrong. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's my big fight in my career is to, to unlock that potential by being able to support that financial, create a cyclical economy of emergency management within the Métis Nation. Um, but the fact of the matter is, like, to answer your question, Jen, like, it's already there. It's just about who you know. And it's about putting out that, that, that call that's saying, hey, who out there can help in emergency management? Who's in emergency management in the Métis National Council? The amount of, or sorry, the Métis Nation, the amount of hands that go up with people that just want to help their community is like, it is, uh, it's, it's one of the coolest things I've gotten to take part of in, in, in my career so far, is just seeing the amount of energy, effort, excitement that, uh, that our nation, our, our relations have put forward in saying, I want to build this too. Thank you, yeah, sure. This will be our last question. Good afternoon, gentlemen. My name is Karen Collins. I come from Elizabeth Métis Settlement, so I'd be a neighbor to where Ramsey's doing some work. And my question is a little bit, of, I, I've been here for the last couple of days, understanding that we've been invited by the UN um, for a global summit to hear from indigenous people. And of course, I'm very glad to be among my, uh, my relatives in the Métis Nation. Another good term, by the way, is kakkyo and wako maganak, all my relations. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll sit with you later and I'll give you the spelling. So you, oh, he, oh, he already did it? Oh, yes. <laughs> and so I've been sitting here thinking, okay, to hear from the indigenous people so that our message goes forward to, to uh, the tables, applicable tables at the, at the UN is, for one thing, I, I would have liked to have heard or know what are our, our indigenous relatives saying, First Nations relatives or Inuit relatives, and of course we hear what we're saying as, as Métis, but somewhere along the line, a report will have to be done here, is the, here are the recommendations from the indigenous people in Canada with respect to this. Somebody's got to respond for the money that this costs, so there's going to be a report. So I think about what's going to be this collective um, position or recommendations or however it ends up being from the collective indigenous people in Canada. So that's one part of 
where my brain goes. Another part says, okay, let's bring it back a little bit closer to home. Our experts here, and I, I'm so glad that you're, you could come and share with us in Canada, but I think what opportunities do our experts have to sit with the First Nations experts, the Inuit experts to say, okay, Indigenous experts, are we all on the same page? Do we do all of these things the same? How often do you guys do it if you do it? When do we, when do we as collective Indigenous people get to hear from some of that bowl of knowledge that sits there? Because I do know, and we had an opportunity to chat, that on the ground, it's like you, like you all said, who cares who you are? This fire's coming and it's coming. And um, yeah, so I kind of think like that. It's, I'm, I'm very glad to be here hearing from, and I'm so very proud of you gen gentlemen for, for um, having that area of expertise. Because sometimes in the hustle and bustle of city life, some people don't even think about what's going on in the forest. And yet, I live a mile and a half from the Saskatchewan border. When fires happen between Fishing and Elizabeth that we border each other and the Saskatchewan border, things are burning down because nobody can decide who the heck should be involved here. Do the settlements have an agreement with the MDs? Is it the St. Paul one? Is it the Bonneville one? What happened to Alberta? Oh my gosh, the fire came from Saskatchewan. Did anybody remember to talk to those people? Because on the other side, that's First Nations land and Saskatchewan government who owns part of it. And like, who's gonna pay for these guys to come and put out this fire? And it's a, just a bunch of it's being recorded, so I'm not gonna <laughs> say what. But, but you can you can all for those who know me, you can almost imagine what I'm what I'm what I'm thinking. But, um, yeah, I just needed to share a little bit of that because I'm 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 getting to an age where pretty soon now they're gonna start calling me, you know, she belongs in the elders group, and you know, so I have to have some of these wise <laughs> things to be able to share, right? But. I think wisdom is collected from here and there, bits and pieces of thank you for sharing that, that all of that. Uh, it's been a long time since I was reminded about the, the places of the fire. And um, yeah, so the Naskum Tanao for your words. Thank you. And I think there was a great question embedded in there, um, you know, around the communication piece around the different groups, and I don't know if, if you guys caught that question or if you have any comments on that as we wrap. I was involved in a research project funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, before the divorce, uh, and uh, <laughs> they, they were curious, but they wanted to know, somebody in the system wanted to know the, the role of indigenous knowledge in disaster risk reduction. So we're talking in emergency management, broader term um, encapsulated in the Sendai framework, which is, was written by the United <laughs> Nations Disaster Risk Reduction Office. Um, and so me and a guy, John Scott uh, Clinkett, uh, been based in Washington, he's been lobbying for indigenous disaster risk reduction for 20 years. Um, we traveled around, we went to we, a Kaluit, around Canada, ended up in a Kaluit as well. Um, he went to Ethiopia, we both went to New Zealand, uh, and we were talking to indigenous emergency managers about indigenous knowledge and disastrous reduction. Nine-tenths of the replies were kind of mundane logistical things. They needed up-to-date, you know, new radios, GPS hardware, software. Um, they were getting fire trucks that were donated from the nearest non-Indigenous community when they got upgraded. So they get these 20-year-old fire trucks and all that. So it was actually, and we, we kept trying to pull it down to, not down, to talk about Indigenous knowledges. And a lot of them said, well, you know what, it doesn't, a lot of what we're seeing and observing isn't captured because of the pace of change. This was something specifically they were saying up in Akaluit, that the elders there they were saying the sun, the sun has moved, right? So the seasons are different, and so they couldn't read the ice so good anymore. So the pace of change, they haven't, we haven't got knowledge systems that can adapt. So elders everywhere, knowledge keepers everywhere, are very 
often very comfortable, even, even super curious to work with scientists or whoever because they've got questions. They want to know what's happening, how's it going on. So it's in collaboration. It's in, it's in working partnerships that we rapidly find out stuff because we're having to make rapid responses. But, but to your question on um, here, I mean, I know MNC commissioned a report on emergency management about three, four years ago. I was consulted on that. I've seen a copy. It's available online. Um, but the, uh, First Nations have their emergency management forum. There's there's a lot of really active stuff. So that's all there, but you're right. What pulls it together? And I'd argue disaster risk reduction is a sovereign right. It is your sovereign right as people to control the risks that you identify because they'll be different from the risks that other people identify. Uh, and and I'd again, just speaking to New Zealand, we find it hard to collaborate across tribes um, unless there's really some sort of, um, it's often financial, unless there's some reason to do it that makes it worth people's time and effort and energy. We, 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 we're pragmatic to a fault, Māori. Like we, we will deal with whoever and whatever. And I think we risk a lot of stuff in that. So I'm just saying that I'm, I won't speak to the situation here, but... Uh, it's hard to, to cooperate and collaborate with people if you don't get to meet regularly, face to face. Doing stuff online, it's just so dull. It doesn't resonate and you can't, you know, how do you trust people that, man, they've got f deep fake AI stuff out there now. They're like, you could be talking to anybody. You, so, so our practices of face to face meetings matter. So for it to happen, a process would be that people would simply come together over periods of time and then confront the government, but it's a sovereignty issue to me. That's what scares the government, right? Uh, I just wanted to add, um, I 100% understand everything you're saying about the borders and jurisdictions and everything. It's, it's a really messy uh, part of the province, and um, I feel like a part of it is intentional. Um, as someone that's trying to write like emergency management plans for Métis settlement, like there's so many challenges around the differences between the Métis settlements and the First Nations and where the funding comes from and all these weird things. And it's just, it's, it almost seems like it's built into the system to make uh, responding to wildfires like that difficult. Uh, but also another thing is that in Alberta, uh, there's something called the wildfire protection area or forest protection area. Uh, so that's the area that Alberta wildfire will respond to. And this, uh, this highlights like what the province prioritizes. That forest protection area, the borders aren't based around what communities are at risk or what areas of the province are at risk of a wildfire. It's based on timber values. Because if you look at a map of the forest protection area, you see that there's a lot of these indigenous communities that are just outside of that area, and they are green. They're completely green. Uh, there's been wildfires that have impacted those communities and almost burnt them down, <laughs> and yet they're not in the forest protection area because they don't have enough of a lumber industry to justify protecting their timber values. And uh, yeah, Fishing Lake and Elizabeth, right outside of that forest protection area. Kikano Métis Settlement, uh, uh, lots of the reserves, like Cold Lake First Nation, Frog Lake First Nation, Cahuan, um, and Buffalo Lake Métis Settlement, like they're just outside of that forest protection area, and they have just as much forest in those communities, surrounding those communities, as any other community in the forest protection area, yet they're not included. It's because of those timber values. So that really shows like what the priorities are. And I also, I think you want to talk about the Thunderbird Collective a little bit, eh? Or, yeah? We yeah. have about two minutes left. Two minutes, all yeah, right. That would love fantastic. to hear. Yeah. Uh, so prior to being here, Ramsey and I were uh, out in Kamloops for uh, a, a fantastic kind of meeting of uh, an organization that we both sit on the steering committee for and uh, represent the Métis Voice on, uh, the Thunderbird Collective, which is essentially bringing together like all our relations. You know, I got two minutes. I can't learn it right now. But bringing <laughs> together all our relations and wildfire experts from all nations, all parts of Canada, uh, indigenous wildfire experts, and, and trying to develop a shared space where we can get back to the origins of the fire that we carry. 
um, of sharing those relationships, sharing that the knowledge we have on fire, and then beyond that, advocating for it, bringing bringing that to spaces like Ottawa or beyond. Um, so it's it's an extremely exciting room to be in because I mean for me it's like we have Amy Cardinal Christensen in there who's a M&A citizen we have uh, Joe Kil Gilchrist um, from uh, the Shushwap or sorry Okanagan kind of area there and for me to sit in that room it's like sitting in there with Wayne Gretzky and Le Mario Lemieux and uh, a young Connor McDavid oh, young Connor McDavid sorry I'm a Flames fan so it's uh, <laughs> uh, you'll find out tonight um <laughs> So uh, it, it's very exciting, and it's, it, it kind of just goes back to those organic relations and those kinship and, uh, and how we're united by the land. And I believe fire is the truth of the land, our culture is the truth of the land, and our, our relations, our kinship ties are a truth of the land. And uh, it's a very, very exciting group to be a part of. So uh, if you see anything from the Thunderbird Collective in the, the coming years here, make sure to give it a good read and throw some energy behind it. Thank you. Wow, thank you all. Um, I want to thank Dane. I want to thank Simon. I want to thank Ramsey for being here, for being so engaging. Um, I have learned more in this um, panel discussion than I have over the last two days, so I'm very excited by it. Um, thank you to our audience for your questions and for being here and present with us. Um, and we are wrapping up, so we are now moving into a break. So uh, it is, yeah, a hand of applause, shout. yes. Thank you very much for your moderation. And also, um, got to acknowledge, and I know, and Dane acknowledged Kate's support to, to pull us all together and, and no, I know, I'm putting, I'm putting beyond, 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 <laughs> beyond on the horizon, uh, you know, to, to, to fly me here. Like I said, I'm sick of online presentations. Uh, to, to put me up in a, in a really flash hotel. I took photos of the bathroom and stuff when I got in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, like, anything I can do to help MNC in this space again, Kate, like, you just ask and, like, I'll do that. And there's a lot of international connections you can build on and, and you just carve the space. Honestly, there's a void, you fill it, you take it. Sovereignty. Kia ora koutou. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll see you back in the main room at 2.45. My name's Bobby. Nice to meet you. Um, I just wanted to say that you did a great job. 